This is Nate Hansen. And Tim Ritter. We are almost heretical. So much of the hand-wringing and stress about this is because people are wanting the Bible just to be something it's not. It's not an answer book. It's not an owner's manual. It's not a position paper for your political views. It's not just this uh, list of rules and what's right and what's wrong. You know, it's most, it's poetry, it's letters, it's stories, it's songs, it's ancient philosophy and proverbs. You know, it's, it's all of these genres that just don't fit nicely into bullet points. You can find us online at almostheoretical.com. Welcome back to Almost Heretical. We started this show because we saw all of the millions of people who are at a point in their spiritual and theological journeys where a lot of what they formerly believed and the way they saw the world just isn't working anymore. This has led to many of you leaving or not fitting into this evangelical world anymore, and some people kind of getting pushed out of that world. So we're on this journey with you. We want to have conversations to help give the Bible back to you and give God back to you. And to say that you don't need to reject God, the Bible, Jesus, you're really just rejecting a version of what you've been handed and that there's so many other ways to think about this thing. And oftentimes these ideas predate some of the ideas we feel like we need to leave behind. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by Rachel Held Evans to chat about lots of things, but also her new book, Inspired, Slaying Giants, Walking on Water, and Loving the Bible Again. She has been such a wonderful help for me personally and so many others with her books like Searching for Sunday and my favorite, Faith Unraveled, just so accurately writing our experiences and helping us not feel crazy, honestly. Uh, So in a lot of ways, Rachel has helped give the Bible back to me and and God back to me in in a much more beautiful and, and human way. So I'm really thrilled to finally get to talk to you, Rachel. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so you and I have had pretty similar experiences, honestly, in our journeys of faith and how we were raised. And um, and I'd say mostly good experiences um, and mostly good exceptions to kind of the bad norms of some of the uh, theological world that, uh, that we came from. But eventually these ideas that we hold start to kind of feel limiting and cracks start to show up in that worldview. And I'm just curious for you, what were those first cracks that you started seeing. Yeah, yeah. And I I think a lot of people can relate to the fact that, you know, I had a pretty decent upbringing and I'm pretty grateful for the family I was raised in was very grace-filled and thoughtful. And so I didn't really find my family uh, limiting, but certainly the broader culture, like the broader evangelical culture, uh, though it was also pretty good to me growing up, um, I did bump into those questions and those cracks in the wall, you know, when I was a young adult. So what I, not everybody can remember the moment their faith started to fall apart, but, but I can, I can actually remember the moment I, I saw that first crack in the wall And it was, uh, I was in college, this is going to make me sound old, I was in college during 9-11, and uh, so it was just just after the towers had fallen and the U.S. was looking at invading Afghanistan, the press kept running all of this old footage from Afghanistan in this documentary called Behind the Veil, and it was about what life is like for women, or was like for women in Afghanistan under the rule of the Taliban. And uh, they they kept showing this footage over and over again, probably to justify the U.S. uh, taking military action there. Um, But it did open my eyes to just what life was like for other people in other parts of the world. And I'll never forget there was this one scene where um, all of the footage was shot by women themselves, like using cameras under those big burkas that they uh, were wearing. And so there's this kind of shaky home video footage of a woman being uh, dragged out to the middle of a soccer field where the the crowd is there's a big crowd there the stands are filled with people and she's been accused of like adultery or something like that and they just drag her out to the middle of this soccer field and push her down onto the ground and you know put an AK-47 to her head and they shoot and she's executed in front of all these people. I later learned her name was Zarmina and 
uh, yeah, she was a mother, a young mother, and, um, you know, she had never had a trial or anything like that. And as I watched this footage get played over and over again, especially that particular scene, the thought that kept going through my mind was everything I had been taught growing up assures me that this woman just went to hell for eternity because she's a Muslim and only evangelical Christians and maybe like a Methodist here and there actually go to heaven um, when they die. And so for me, it was it was the question of religious pluralism. Like, how can it be that only evangelical Christians are uh, saved and going to heaven when they die? Uh, what about all these other people and all these other parts of the world who've either never heard of Jesus or who had lives like this woman's Armina uh, that were already filled with suffering and, um, you know, who really had no opportunity to encounter the gospel as I knew it. You know, am I really supposed to believe that the overwhelming majority of people to have lived on this earth never even had a chance at salvation? And that was it and everything fell apart. <laughs> so that was, the, that was, and then it became, you know, what about evolution? What about science? What about gender and sexuality? Like once you have that one question, like I completely believe in the slippery slope. <laughs> it just sometimes it leads you to some good places. Um, I totally went down the slippery slope of doubt. Like I was, I was questioning everything. Um, yeah. And it, it's been hard, you know, it's isolating, it's lonely to go through that experience a lot. Um, but it's also been pretty powerful too and, and good. Yeah, that's so funny. We actually just did a show on the slippery slope and how oftentimes you have to go through that. I mean, Chris, Christian mysticism talks about, you know, going through the dark night of the soul in order to arrive at this maturity that you couldn't actually get any other way. So I, that's really cool that that you were talking about that. I, I remember in your book, uh, I think it was Faith Unraveled or what's the other title? Is, that's what it, that's the title, right? That's the new one. Yeah, it used to okay. well, it used to be Evolving in Monkey Town, but nobody got it, so we changed the oh. title. <laughs> it's such a I love that title so much better too. It's awesome. I know me too, <laughs> but you know, not everybody is is up on their you know turn of the century courtroom history. Right. Which the illusion is kind of, yeah. So right. <laughs> it's all right. But you talk about in Faith Unraveled that this idea of the Bible being used as a weapon. And I think that's a lot of the people that listen to our show have experienced the Bible in that way. I mean, we talk about that. We talk about it's the sword. And, uh, and so that's this idea of using the Bible as a weapon. And people have felt um, the either the encouragement to use the Bible in that way, or they felt actually the weapon of the Bible used against them. Yeah. And I guess... Yeah, I just want to talk about that a little bit. Why do you think we're tempted to make the Bible into a weapon? Yeah, did you do sword drills growing up? Totally. <laughs> yeah. I, I would good. totally beat your oh, ass no. at one of those now. Those? No, just kidding. <laughs> we have to do that live. I need an explanation. I, oh. I wasn't familiar with any of that world. You didn't do sword drills? No. Oh, what's your background? Uh, kind of like, like loose cultural Christianity grown up, but not nearly as deep as you guys were. <laughs> <laughs> you are not hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> no, no, I'll reference, I'll reference sword drills from time to time. And if I'm speaking to like post evangelical audiences, they're like, Oh yeah. You know? And I'm like, let's do a sword drill. And we do sword drill. And it's fun. If I'm speaking to like mainline Protestants, they're like, what? That sounds that sounds violent, you know? <laughs> like, so a sword drill, um, it's like if you're in Sunday school or vacation Bible school or um, church camp, uh, you like three people or the whole group gets their Bibles out and the leader calls out a verse and they say like, ready, swordsman. And you say, ready. And then you call, they call out the verse and whoever can find it first and stand up and read the verse oh, wins. Gotcha. It got ugly. So, oh yeah, it got very ugly. <laughs> and there's ways to kind of cheat too a little bit. And like a lot depends on the Bibles that you're using. So I insist on like standard issue. Everybody has the same Bible. Otherwise, you know, there's like tabs and yeah, stuff. You can't have then, it, yeah, you can't have the tab. Yeah. But you also, a lot of it was knowing like the context of what they were talking about to know like they're probably going Old Testament here. They're probably going New Testament. They're probably going Paul, <laughs> right. you know, like you got to know. <laughs> Bonus points if you've, if you've memorized it, you know. <laughs> I'm realizing now I actually did one of these. I just didn't know that's what it was called at uh, the first time I ever went to a youth group summer camp. I won a Jars of Clay, their first EP. I, I won for some sort of Bible verse recognition thing. Maybe they called it that and I just don't remember it. What? 
you won without any practice like wow i mean this was like this is like early days i think it was probably like if you got new testament or old testament you know? yeah that's still really <laughs> impressive and like winning a jars of clay album is like classic yeah <laughs> we must be close in age um Wait, what was what were we originally talking? Oh, the Bible is a weapon. Um, besides yeah, yeah, yeah. the sword drill context, but <laughs> yeah, I think that a lot of people, uh, you know, have had that experience, and like, you know, for me, I, it wasn't used particularly violently, but I do recall in high school being told by guys, especially after I would I would give my testimony and do, you know do a little bit of public speaking in youth group. And I would often be told by guys that it's too bad that I was a girl because I was actually a pretty good speaker. And, you know, the Bible says uh, a woman cannot preach or have authority over a man. So, you know, too bad. <laughs> you won't actually get to be a pastor or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, it was used against me in that in those ways. It was certainly limiting. People used it to limit what I could do as a woman and what I might be called to do. Um, but then I think of like LGBTQ people and uh, just how much more violently the Bible has been used about, you know, against them and historically against uh, people of color and to this day, um, you know, the way it was used to justify American slavery. So, you know, the Bible has been used as a weapon in all the wrong ways. Um, and so I think that's one reason why I understand that a lot of people are reluctant to come back to the Bible. You know, if they have broken away from church uh, for their own you know, health and sanity and, and well-being, uh, or if they have, you know, taken a, a step away from their faith for a time as they work on reconstructing and rebuilding that faith. I get that for a lot of people, the Bible's just, it has so much baggage because it's been uh, used violently against them or cruelly, or maybe just they, you know, all these stories we grew up with that we once loved, you know, like Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, you know, you read that as an adult and it ends with God telling Joshua and his soldiers to kill every man, woman, and child in this city. So you encounter stuff like that and the, the patriarchy and, and, and other issues. And it can be hard to recover that love of scripture, which is what I'm really aiming to do with this latest project is, uh, you know, in, help people engage the Bible with their head and heart fully operating with their doubts, with their questions, with their skepticism, with their ideas and with their creativity, um, you know, to come back to the Bible and see how it might still be healing and might still still be relevant. Because um, that's kind of been the journey I've been on in the last few years is just really not wanting anything to do with the Bible for a while, uh, even though I was like the world's biggest Bible nerd, to wanting to come back to it. And so I kind of write about the influences that led me there. And I try to, to introduce some of that scholarship and some of those interpretive postures creatively through story and poem and, and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think one of the main ideas underlying the book Inspired is is actually one of the main reasons we started this podcast, which is hmm. us coming back to a belief that the Bible itself is one of the greatest tools we have to de-weaponize the Bible. Yeah. So would you be willing to kind of expound on that, like how you've seen that, where you came kind of back to that uh, belief or, or appreciation for the scriptures? Yeah, yeah. There's a really good book. I think it's called, it's uh, called The Talking Book, and it's about... Um, uh, the Bible and the African American experience, and the writer whose name has just slipped my mind, I reference him in Inspired, uh, talks a lot about that, about how the same scripture that was used to justify the oppression of black people in this country uh, was also used by those people to say, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. 